Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. So today is another edition of a Sminty Book Club. And for today's book, it was a listener suggestion. So thank you, Stephanie, yes, yes. for sending this in. We love it when we get these suggestions. So it helps us choose our topics and books and movies. So keep those coming in. And uh, you've already read this book, right, Samantha? At this I have. Point. Yeah, I uh, read this in college. And I, th- I realized, I think I read this just for fun. Uh-huh. I worked at a college bookstore. And because I got discounts, I just went through and bought all the books that I could uh-huh. right then because it was way cheaper than going to like a Barnes & Noble. And I think Amazon really hadn't... We were using eBay at that point. And oh. I hadn't really gotten into the eBay thing. So uh-huh. this was the best way I could get cheaper books. But this is one yeah. of them. Yeah. I was reminded of that the other day for some reason of that whole college experience of trying to find the cheapest textbooks. Yeah. And like getting the used, like, quadruple used (laughs) textbooks. And I would love the professors, and I think they still do it now. They'd be like, just get the old edition, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And before we get into uh, delving into this book, we did want to put a really quick trigger warning on this one. We're not going to go too deep into any of these topics, but some of the topics in this book are heavy. They include things like domestic abuse, sexual assault, sexual abuse, and we will be discussing those. So if that's something that is not good for you and not in the mental space for, take care of yourself. So I had never read this until until we got the suggestion, but today we are talking about the 1984 novel, The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros, which was a critically acclaimed book that is on school and university syllabi across the country. It's considered a classic example of Chicana literature. Since its release, it's sold over 6 million copies and been translated into 20 different languages. It is equally heartfelt, inspiring, devastating, and joyful. And a bit about the author, Cisneros is a poet, short story writer, novelist, and essayist. Her work has been the recipient of several awards like the MacArthur Fellowship, the Ford Foundation's Art of Change Fellowship, as well as several honorary doctorates. She was also recognized among the Frederick Douglass 200. President Obama gave her the National Medal of the Arts in 2016. And in 2019, this book won the P.E.N. Nabokov Award for Achievement in International Literature. Apart from The House on Mango Street, she wrote the novel Caramello, collections of short stories and poetry. She's written a children's book and an autobiography called A House of My Own. And on top of that, she founded the Macondo Foundation, which is an organization of writers dedicated to supporting underserved communities. So the book covers a range of topics in short chapters or vignettes about the people who live on a blue-collar Chicago street in the Hispanic Quarter told through the eyes of a young girl who acts as a narrator. Cats, names, house owners, sisterhood, family, death, grief, first jobs, sexual harassment slash sexism, race, identity, class, patriarchy, home, writing, reading, remembering where you came from, and domestic violence. That's all part of this vignette. Because of some of the themes in this book, not surprisingly, it's been banned from schools and libraries several times over. And in 2012, it was one of 80 books banned under Arizona House Bill 2281 that prohibited, quote, classes to advocate the overthrow of the United States, promote racial resentment, or emphasize students' ethnicities rather than their individuality. (sighs) Yeah, uh, teachers, writers, and activists came together to form the Libro Traficante Project, a caravan that traveled from Alamo to Tucson, handing out the banned books and holding workshops. Cisneros herself participated. And as of early 2020, Gal Mott, the producer of the Netflix show Narcos, is set to turn The House on Mango Street into a TV drama. After declining similar adaptions for years, she said, I write because the world we live in is a house on fire and the people we love are burning. Television has grown up in the last 20 years and now is the time to tell our stories. And uh, yeah, if it goes through, she will be the show's executive producer, one of them at least. Oh, I can't imagine what kind of stories this will be. I think it'll be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So this book is a coming-of-age story of a young Latina woman, Esperanza, which means hope, Cordero, and her observing the world around her and trying to make sense of her place in it. It has many elements that feel autobiographical. It takes place over the span of a year as she goes from 12 years old to 13 years old. 
In the copy I read, it opens with a forward by Cisneros written in the third person about her time living alone in her Chicago apartment and writing this book. Here's a quote. She thinks stories are about beauty, beauty that is there to be admired by anyone, like a herd of clouds grazing overhead. She thinks people who are busy working for a living deserve beautiful little stories because they don't have much time and are often tired. She has in mind a book that can be opened at any page and will still make sense to the reader who doesn't know what came before or comes after. She experiments creating a text that is as succinct and flexible as poetry, snapping sentences into fragments so that the reader pauses, making each sentence serve her and not the other way around. Abandoning quotation marks to streamline the typography and make the page as simple and readable as possible so that the sentences are pliant as branches and can be read in more ways than one. Right. I definitely loved her book. And you and I talked about this before we recorded because of the poetry. Mm-hmm. And I, I, that's kind of, this is kind of, if I were to write, this is how I write, is fragmented sentences. But I, I want an emotion and that emotion doesn't feel like it needs to be a descriptor. It just needs to be Mm-hmm. And whether it has a subject, whether it has, you know, a, a, an actual punctuation, that's how I write. And I see that and I feel that. And you could definitely see her poetry influence all throughout these, these vignettes. And it's a beautiful story to me. Yeah, so she's described her experiences teaching and working with younger folks too and her heartbreak at losing such potential when systemic issues forced talented students to drop out. Quote, at the university, I work for a program that no longer exists. The Educational Opportunity Program that assists disadvantaged students is in keeping with my philosophy and I can still help the students from my previous job. But when my most brilliant student is accepted, enrolled, and drops out in her first semester, I collapse on my desk from grief, from exhaustion, and feel like dropping out myself. And along with that, she's described her own experiences as a young writer feeling othered due to her class, race, and gender. Yeah. And I feel like that was a really great forward that she wrote in in the third person where she was describing these things and kind of looking back on herself at this time when she was writing this. And I totally agree with you about like the poetry and also that you could just pick it up at any chapter and not necessarily need to know what came before or after. Right. I think also she does a great job in talking about the other. You know, growing up, that was definitely how I felt more than anything. I I didn't know what any of that meant, but I was definitely not a part of it. I was the other. She talks a lot about that too. And and the forward wasn't there when I first read it because this was like 2000 when I read it. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it was still like 20 years old and it was a deemed classic in literature, but didn't have this forward. And I love that reminiscing from her looking back and how much she loves it. And it still mm-hmm. stands that experience and just like looking back on what we see as a biography of someone's life possibly in Chicago. Mm-hmm. So let's get into some themes as we love to do. Yes. <laughs> One of the big ones is family. Family features heavily throughout this novel especially the narrator's relationships with and observations of the women in her family from her grandmother, her mother, her aunt, her sister, and how they shaped and influenced her. This is in contrast to Cisneros' own experience. She has spoken about how she felt isolated being the only daughter in a family of seven children. In the book, Esperanza greatly respects her mother and feels safe around her. She's inspired by her mother's um, languages that she can speak and music skills, finding her to be the source of wisdom. Her mother regrets dropping out of school and encourages Esperanza to keep up her studies. I love her chapter about her mom when she talks about she'd be stirring her soup and just point at the spoon. She's like, you don't, you know, I could have been different. Basically, you know, all these yeah. things. It's quite beautiful. And then her line, one of my favorite lines is the shame about how shame is a killer of dreams. Mm-hmm. It, ugh, I know probably get more into it, but, but ugh, I loved <laughs> it. Here's an excerpt from the book about her great-grandmother. Uh, My great-grandmother, I would have liked to have known her, a wild horse of a woman. She, so wild that she wouldn't marry, until my great-grandfather threw a sack over her head and carried her off, just like that, as if she were a fancy chandelier. That's the way he did it. And the story goes, she never forgave him. She looked out the window her whole life, the way so many women sit their sadness on an elbow. I wonder if she made the best with what she got, or was she sorry because she couldn't be all the things that she wanted to be? Esperanza. I've inherited her name, but I don't want to inherit her place by the window. So good. Yeah, we're going to talk about that more too, but this uh, Esperanza observing this cyclical treatment of women or or just these things, generational happening 
over and over again and her having the same name as, as her great grandmother and trying to get out of that cycle that she sees in her family. And then there's Aunt Lupe, who dies of illness and pushes Esperanza to keep writing before she dies, obviously, because it will grant her freedom. Esperanza chides herself for ever wanting in any way to be like her Aunt Lupe. And I read some essays about how she represents Guadalupe, kind of the Virgin Mary in our Christian English parlance. And it, that that whole plot line, it was very sad um, because Aunt Lupe, she did the thing. Like she had the husband and the kids and it was sort of abandoned Mm-hmm. It felt like, and I have an aunt where it sort of went that way too. And it, it, just the way people talked about her and treated her, right. just really as a kid, I would observe it and it would upset me. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. We see the narrator struggle too with the Mexican heritage she encounters in her home and family and the American culture she's growing up in and the tension there for her and trying to navigate that whole thing. Right. I think that's so on point with a lot of children, especially first generation trying to acclimate to the U.S. or to America. And so, therefore, to acclimate is to ignore your culture and identity mm-hmm. ethnicity, which most grown-ups, including myself, <laughs> come to regret. Mm-hmm. And realize, man, I really wish I could have these following things. So I found that very, just too close. <laughs> <laughs> Another theme, of course, is the house and the house in general. Uh, and there are a lot of passages about homes and houses. In some way, it is the heart of the book. Esperanza describes her embarrassment at the home they live in, at being mocked for it. Uh, Esperanza herself claims it's not a real house like she's seen on television, the picket fence, the beautiful mm-hmm. two-story family home. And she describes wanting to get out, wanting a house of her own. I did really love her little bit about the attic. hmm the bums in the attic. But she spent much of her childhood moving from house to house and the family dreaming of this perfect house and the house on Mongo Street is not what they wanted. Esperanza continues to daydream about this perfect house and even writes about it. And yeah, they even say at one point, this is not the last house to try to promise the kids are going to move on, even though it's their house. They own it. And she writes, what about a house, I say, because that's what I came for. Ah, yes, a home in the heart. I see a home in the heart. Is that it? And here's another quote. No, this isn't my house, I say, and shake my head as if shaking could undo the year I've lived here. I don't belong. I don't ever want to come from here. You have a home, Alicia, and one day you'll go there to a town you remember. But me, I never had a house, not even a photograph, only one I dreamt of. No, Alicia says, like it or not, you are Mango Street, and one day you'll come back to. Not me, not till somebody makes it better. And some essays suggest that the house is a metaphor for a woman's body providing home and shelter and Esperanza's search for a home and rejection of her current one is representative of her search for her identity. Right. I mean, of course, this could also go as deep as to saying this is also about her ethnicity and her uh, culture and Mm -hmm. her background and, and the body is kind of that culture she's trying to escape from. And being there makes it feel so unwelcome because she doesn't want to be there. She wants what's perfection and what perfection is in her eyes is Americanized. Right. And that's going to be a whole different conversation too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we do have a lot more themes to cover. But first, we have a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Yeah, thank you, sponsor. So going on with themes, another theme the narrator struggles with through her interactions with women of various ages is womanhood. Cisneros dedicated this book, um, Las Mujeres, to the women. Outside of her family, she has two friends that are girls. At one point, along with her sister, they strut around the neighborhood in high heels. Other older girls in the neighborhood, like Alicia, a young university student who deals with the challenges of being a lower-income Latina girl in that space, and goes on to kind of scorn the community and culture of Mongo Street. Marin, a babysitter who waits for change that never comes, Sally, a young girl who wears a lot of makeup and revealing clothes, or her Aunt Lupe who dies during the book. And one aspect of this is the harassment, abuse, and sexual assault often faced by women. Sally, for instance, her father's abusive, and she believes that the only way for her to escape that is to find a man to marry who goes on to abuse her too. Both Sally and her mother, Sally's mother, make excuses for the violence in their home. 
representing that cycle of violence many women do face. Esperanza feels something like a pity for Sally and her youth of not being able to, quote, find a way out. However, their relationship suffers greatly after Esperanza is sexually assaulted by a group of men after Sally leaves her at a carnival for a boy. At another time, Esperanza describes being forcibly kissed by an older man. Right, and of course, we could also talk about the sexualization of young Latino girls in general Mm -hmm. and how that becomes a part very problematic because for some reason, culture in general really loves sexualizing marginalized girls. And because they experiment, it means that they're now open property, which is a whole conversation that she is trying to combat in this conversation as you see Asperanza's thought process. And even like Sally's change, she goes from wearing all this makeup to Mm -hmm. wiping it off, you know, and that's this whole like conversation of what does that mean and who takes the blame for what? (laughs) Yeah, lots of thoughts on that. So throughout the book, the narrator desires to break out of limiting and constraining gender norms. Uh, We see these gender norms throughout multiple facets, including cultural and in settings like academics. In her observations of the girls and women in her life, Esperanza concludes that they are all trapped by men in their lives and by a patriarchal system that limits them in a domestic roles. And this is passed on from generation to generation. The idea of the perfect domestic wife and mother and that being the goal or perhaps for many the only option. Yeah, and going back to the high heels, when the girls first try them on, they're so excited to try them on. But that excitement quickly turns into something like panic, a feeling that their bodies are no longer their own, that their feet are no longer their own, and they get rid of the shoes. Esperanza fights, quote, her own quiet war where she leaves the table like a man without putting back the chair or picking up the plate. But in doing so, left some women behind. And I love that that if you, you can interpret that in a way where they are maturing and, and coming into womanhood and you're trying on these high heels, but it reflects the objectification of when their bodies are no longer their own like your feet are no longer your own right? when you come into this, which I really liked. Yeah, I also love the point in which the mother throws away the shoes mm-hmm. and her referencing that her mom being a clean person mm-hmm. takes away these filthy shoes. And I think that's such a representative of finding herself feeling dirty yeah. because she's been objectified. And these shoes were the cause of her feeling dirty. Mm-hmm. And whether it really was dirty versus how she felt. And that represents so many of us who've gone through any type of trauma, especially being sexualized or sexually harassed. That level of feeling dirty and doing yeah. whatever you can to get rid of it. I felt like that was very poignant mm-hmm. in that moment of her trying to be like, this is how I'm going to get rid of it. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to look back. Right. But of course, we can't let go of that because... Society is the worst. Irresponsibility. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Something else this book touches on is this idea of responsibility to others who don't have the same opportunities you do uh, to remember where you came from. And again, I think this is, I've talked about this many a times where I, as a marginalized woman who came from a bad circumstance to a better circumstance, the level of responsibility I feel in making it better. I think that could be a whole overarching conversation for marginalized women in general. Those of us who are able to get out of those situations Mm -hmm. feel like there's this whole other level of needing to pull it up. But those responsibilities, instead of being on the people who are being oppressive, falls onto those who have been able to make it out, which is this bigger conversation of, yes, we definitely need that. We need to pull each other up. But why aren't we breaking down the systems that's blocking us to begin with? And I think she does a great job in talking about how she feels that she needs to do this. And her, like, forward, when she talks about she collapses because she sees one more student not Mm -hmm. meet that potential that could pull them out. Mm -hmm. This level of failure that you feel. And I felt that completely in my jobs before when I couldn't change a kid or I couldn't get this kid to see what I see. You Mm -hmm. know, there's so many of those conversations. And yeah, I think when you leave, you must remember to come back for the others. That's what she says. That she talks about. That's her quote that she says. And I think that wears on so many young women mm-hmm. who feel like they've gotten to be bettered. And so being bettered means having a responsible to better others. Mm-hmm. But she continues to say, a circle, understand. You will always be Esperanza. You will always be Manga Street. You can't erase what you know. You can't forget who you are. Again, like a coming back to the subject of responsibility, which is... I'm really glad she points to that and we talk about that. And of course, I think when I read it in 2000 versus to reading it in 2021, Mm -hmm. the vast growth that I've had to have in learning that, yes, I want to better the community, but I don't necessarily, that is not my responsibility. That's not something that should be squarely on me. And that 
if I can't help, if I can't change things, it's not my failure. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I feel it. And I remember with talking about stuff like this, I remember specifically at work, I had a kid who was killed and all these circumstances led to his death. And I just broke down and I remember asking, is this our fault? And another worker was like, yeah, it's our fault. And I was like, turned around (laughs) and looked at her. It was so honest. But that's the way we feel. This is not our child, but we've been given a responsibility to care for them. And don't get me wrong, it was my job, it was my passion, but that level of depth of like having that hang over you Mm -hmm. because you saw a better way and your better way still didn't work, Mm -hmm. you know, and then taking it on as your own failure. There's so many layers to that. And I think when we break it down, especially in the marginalized communities, when we break it down to women in general and the level of misogyny in the patriarchal system that puts that responsibility on people who are already traumatized and have to use that traumatized to move on. And Mm -hmm. then the community looks at them and say, why didn't you do this? Mm -hmm. And ignoring why the system is even in place and why we need to be fighting for this anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that was something the book did really well of kind of navigating is, um, because Esperanza is young Mm -hmm. and she's making these observations that at times feel very cruel or, Mm -hmm. I mean, they have a child trying to observe like in her mind, why is, why are these women allowing, in heavy quotes, like when her mom could be doing more than just being this housewife, which is, yeah, fine if it's your choice, but she's like seeing it through this child's eyes of like judgment almost. And Mm -hmm. I feel like, a lot of the things that Esperanza was frustrated with in terms of w- watching women in her life and and this patriarchal system, I think it was that she didn't quite understand yet that there was the, the systemic problems in place. Right. Like right. she was seeing it, but she didn't have that knowledge or language yet of like that there's a reason it's like this. Right. Uh, yeah. And I go with you on that same level of people are so conditioned to blame their intimate environments and rather mm-hmm. seeing the whole big picture, which is kind of the problem and how we talk about ignorance being the focus and the problem is because this system is a foundation that's been laid out from the beginning. And so therefore, it's hard for us to navigate to realize who is truly at fault and what is truly at fault and yeah. how the system does work against you. And I think it's also interesting as we're talking about the house in general and women staying out their houses. And she talks a lot about women sitting at their windows. Like that's yeah. a theme in every place. And I think she represents, and the reason why she doesn't love her house is this, it's a prison. It becomes a prison that you can't escape and people are seeking to come out and the women are the ones that are imprisoned in these stories. And mm-hmm. whether it's because culture has made them say, this is what I need, or culture has said, the only way you can escape is moving from one abusive situation to the next. Mm-hmm. Or the culture has said that this is the better fit. Like for specifically the woman who came and she's trapped in her house and all she could hear is a woman crying and not willing to speak English. And she just keeps saying, no English, no English. Mm-hmm. He not home, no English. And then crying when she finds that her son is speaking English and she just keeps crying. She wants to go home, but she's trapped now. Like that's that's that whole feeling of, I love that she was a kind of a counter, that she became the one woman who loved her culture and did not want to be in the U.S. as compared to like everybody else saying this is the freedom. Right. But it does talk about that house being in a prison and being mm-hmm. released from it or being seen as a prison for many people. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was interesting too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we wanted to continue this discussion because clearly we've got a lot of thoughts. <laughs> but first, we have one more quick break for a word from our sponsor. And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. So one of the things I wanted to talk about that really resonated with me is this idea of being a kid and watching older kids and trying to figure things out based on what they're doing and like make sense of like how you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to act based on what they're doing. And because the narrator is a writer, she does 
do a lot of observing of people and trying to make sense of them, almost an outside observer a lot of the time. And this is something I really related to because I often felt and sometimes still feel like I am the outside observer and I'm trying to... (laughs) It sounds so strange to say, but especially now that I've worked on the show and this show does involve a lot of self-reflection and like looking back like, why did I feel that way or what was going on? But especially in like this time period of my life of being, you know, middle school, high school, I did feel like I was watching people and I didn't understand why they behaved the way they did. Mm -hmm. But I felt like, okay, that's how, that's how normal people behave. Normal people go heavy quotes, boy, crazy, (laughs) and then put on a lot of makeup when you reach this age. And like rebel, and I guess that's what I gotta do. And it would it would scare me, like the the scene with the high heels, that resonated with me too. Of like I would watch these things, and it was it felt like inevitable. Like I remember mm-hmm. once with a, a good friend of mine, who I, still good friends, and is actually going to be on the show soon. Katie, we were walking. I think we were probably eleven or something. And she was like, I can't wait to start dating and get all these boys. And she was telling me all these boys she was into, and I was like. Really? <laughs> I hope that it never happens to me. <laughs> she was like, oh, it will. One day you're just going to be, you're going to be like me. And and I remember being scared of that, like just something was going to click and then I was going to just want to date all the boys or something, right. which is fine. Right. But it did scare me. You know what I mean? I think you and I are going to have a problem because I'm on the same wavelength as you. Mm-hmm. I would watch my sister who started dating way way young and started bringing home boys around 15 years old and had this like stream of boyfriends and I just remember thinking these boys are so dumb (laughs) (laughs) thinking they were so ridiculous and I would just be like why is he doing that I remember asking her specifically because this one boy would just sit and watch her put on makeup and she loved it she was like doing things and he would just sit there and watch her and I remember coming going why are you staring at her? You're being creepy. Like, I specifically <laughs> said that to her. And she's like, oh, Samantha, get out. Like, that that's exactly <laughs> right. what it was. And I was like, okay. And don't get me wrong. I like boyfriends. And I thought it was cool to have boyfriends. And, mm-hmm. and then, two, at I think, like, second grade, I was giving toys and calling boys and saying, I love you, oh. little boys, because it was exciting. Uh-huh. But... That was kind of the extent. Like, to me, relationships meant I don't talk to you. We hold the hands every right. now and again under the, like, cafeteria table, giggle, and write notes to each other. And mm-hmm. that's it. Like, that's the point of the relationships. And when I saw what my sister and her boyfriends were doing, which wasn't bad, don't get me wrong. It was just adoring each other, holding each other's hands, being giggly, you know, opening the door, going on dates. I thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> I did not understand it. And I thought right. he was like, Mike, he's getting on my nerves. How is he not getting on yours? Like that right. was that level. And I think I grew up pretending to be normal so hard. Like I feel like I was constantly watching people to understand the norm because I was constantly chastised for my not being normal. And when I say chastise, a young kid coming from a very traumatic background, learning a culture, a complete Mm -hmm. separate culture, I was told often when I was not being, quote, normal. So that was kind of the extent of my childhood was just to watch what was normal. This young immigrant coming into town without being able to speak English, knowing immediately that I was different, knowing immediately where I was, that I was not one of them, but Mm -hmm. I was a an essential project for them, for many, not just like my parents. And I I, I say that like, I know that sounds cold, but in ideal that this girl was brought from Korea from an orphanage, we have to be really, really nice to her Mm because, you know, she's a sad girl. Mm -hmm. Like, and and it kind of was that and me watching to be either invisible so I could blend in, Mm -hmm. which is that model minority bullshit, or to try to acclimate as fast as possible so that I can represent Whomever I was supposed to represent, whether it was other Koreas, whether it was the McVeigh family, whatever or whatnot, Mm -hmm. that I had to do that very quickly. Right. And so losing a lot of my own identity to get there. So I feel like my whole childhood was all about not being there, not Mm -hmm. being visible. And so therefore being an observer. So it's a whole thing. And acclimating means I also must like white people, white men specifically, and therefore be as heteronormative as possible, but also Mm -hmm. very white. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, I've been thinking about this because you and I, we do both have trauma in our backgrounds. And um, the big chunk of mine did take place in high school, middle school and high school. And it was, 
you know, a formative time in terms of what you think relationships are. And I was also just very confused about what was happening. But I often think I had a friend who also wasn't in... Our experiences were very different, but she had trauma too. And she, like, we just went in completely different ways. Like, Mm -hmm. I was like, I never want to date ever. And she was like, get me a date all the time. (laughs) And it just was one of those things where neither of us were wrong. And we've talked about that a lot. But I felt like I was, there was something wrong with me. Because that we are told that this is part of the, like, becoming a woman. You do, you put on the makeup, you put on the high heels. And you get out there and start dating. <laughs> right. And we talk about this with specifically in reference to this book. Culturally, what she's talking about is this escape. And the only way to escape your current situation is to get to another situ- different situation. But at least you have, you're the main character in that narrative. So whether you're the wife now instead of the daughter or, mm-hmm. you know, all these things. And I think we can talk about that in itself. That it's taken a long time, not only in like the culture within Mongo Street, about how we've come so far. And, mm-hmm. and and again, I think this is where her mom is fantastic. The character of the mom is like, get your education, get your education, get your education. Right. Talking about how important that is and how she could have been somebody. She, you know, could have been bigger than this and understanding that that's what she wants for her daughter. Mm-hmm. So I think like you see that narrative with Esperanza being you, essentially, like not caring about the boys because, you know, she was ready to come with a brick uh, <laughs> defending Sally. Yeah. And I love that too. But mm-hmm. that's kind of that narrative is that, that two separate changes of what you see in the household they grew up in and the prisons they saw that they're themselves in and what escape they felt that they could get to. So I thought that was interesting. And just having that moment of being coming a woman mm-hmm. and what that meant to them. And for her, it meant leaving it and, and getting to a situation where she could help others Mm-hmm. like herself. And for Sally, it meant just leaving and getting into another situation that was similar to before. But at least she's not with her father. Right. Yeah, and, and speaking of that, we do see these women in a lot of situations around sex and violence and how the, their self-worth derives from that. Right. I mean, many of the girls and women Esperanza witnesses Again, it's all about that male attention and often sexual attentions despite the violence they may have experienced. And unfortunately, we do see that narrative, which I did want to ask you, as we've talked about how scenes like this where Cisneros wrote it in such a poetic way, Mm -hmm. you had to take a minute. I'm like, wait, what just happened? Did that just happen? Did the, oh, oh, okay, that was bad. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that writing? So you're talking specifically about like the sexual assault and like abuse. Yes. Yeah. I I thought it was really effective because you did have to, it kind of drew you in and made you question like, what is going on here exactly? Like, am I reading too much into it? Did that actually just happen? Um, And so when Esperanza sexually assaulted, for instance, it was one of those things where I'm like, maybe, (laughs) maybe I need to reread that because I'm not entirely sure that maybe I'm just being, uh, I don't know, paranoid is the right word, but that that with my experience, I'm reading into it was something that's not there. And I think that that, I would imagine intentionally does, because we've spoken before about how trauma is like that, you do kind of compartmentalize them in your brain and you do what you have to to cope. And so I, I thought it was really effective in that way too, of like, this is how she could, communicate it, the young right. narrator of the story. Right. I think, yeah, and I think we talk about Esperanza's um, point of view when it comes to Sally, because mm-hmm. it's never clearly stated what all is happening. We know there's physical abuse with the father, but then obviously him coming to get her and, and saying he missed her, all these things, there was this whole other narrative as if he was trying to plead to his, a wife who left right. him. Mm-hmm. I think is a good... It is. It's a very good take on how do I talk about this without being able to talk about it? How do I describe these moments? Because she also talks about, and the thing that repeats in my head is when the assaulter kept saying, Spanish girl, I love you. Spanish girl, I love you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's such a huge like point of like, yeah, this is not violent. The way we're talking about this is not violent. Right. But it's severely cruel. Like you see that level and heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I think it, she does a really good job in addressing it in a way that's approachable, but at the same time, very, very, very much have to analyze what is happening. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point too of 
it not being violent and kind of showing the different ways that this abuse can manifest. And yeah, just there's also kind of an air of when you look back on those memories, how do you, <laughs> what do you remember and how do you, how do you frame it in your brain? Right. right. Yeah. And th- there's a scene too that I guess is related to what we've been talking about where Esperanza, is it Sally? She witnesses like kissing all mm-hmm. the people and she like runs in and it tells her, tells her mom. Tells, I think Sally's mom. Sally's mom, yeah. Yeah. And is just like freaked out by it and panicked by it. The mom is like, whatever. And she doesn't understand why it upsets her so much. And that again is something that I really relate to, but I also think goes back to that where she wasn't quite putting into place yet this like patriarchy system that she was witnessing because she wants to live by her own rules and there just seem to be all these structures in place that act as obstacles as she's witnessing other women in her life and what they go through. And I think she does a great job when talking about that garden where the monkey was kept Mm -hmm. and how they make this huge tale about it, how it's existed before, you know, the place came around and how it's this magical space for children to be children and to play and how she got kicked out or how she got shamed out because she was too old. Mm -hmm. And so feeling that isolation of not belonging into this magical space that Mm -hmm. was created with her. And I think it's such a huge tell of her own like sadness in growing up and losing childhood and losing it so quickly too and Mm -hmm. not understanding why she had to leave. And again, we don't quite understand why she had to leave essentially, but other than someone told her to, other than someone said it's time, other than someone shaming her and saying, "You're, you're too old for this and you can't enjoy that childhood that you loved at one point, that small bit of childhood that you loved. Yeah. That made you love the space. So I thought that was a big part of that as well. And I also think it's interesting that that's where she retreated to mm-hmm. when she felt that shame of being like, oh, grow up. Yeah. When, you know, when it's like, no, you have every right to be, this is weird, like having that moment and yeah. wanting to protect her friend and uh-huh. losing that friend, but like that she went back to her childhood safe place and just stayed there in mourning of it. Yeah. Yeah. And And when you break down what she is witnessing in this neighborhood and and, and the women in this neighborhood, it is kind of the, your paths are, like we talk about all the time, the virgin or the whore, like you you are going to be relegated to those, one of those paths and probably judged for (laughs) either one. Right. But one is seen as like more selfless and better. Mm -hmm. And that quote I read earlier about her wanting to be like a man, like leave the chair pulled out. And that was juxtaposed against this idea of being a woman being beautiful and cruel and sort of this power coming from that beauty and from putting on the makeup or whatever it is and her not wanting to do that. She didn't want to get her value from beauty. So she wanted to like essentially be more like a man uh, in heavy quotes. Again, it's still that system in place. Like unfortunately, there's only so much you can do there's only so much as a woman you can say like, well, I don't want to get my value from beauty when that's right. what everyone else sees. And you still can, like you absolutely still can. But again, it was just, I think it was another example of her not quite realizing like that, that just that right there of I want to, I'll take the man's route is the patriarchy. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So we had a lot to say about this book. Thank you so much again, Stephanie, yes. for the suggestion. It was lovely and well worth a read, listeners, if you have not read it already. And it's pretty quick, uh, 100-ish pages, so pretty easy read. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us another suggestion, we would love to hear from you. Our email is stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can also find us on Twitter at MomStuffPodcast or on Instagram at Stuff I've Never Told You. Thanks, as always, to our super producer, Christina. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I've Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 